the rise in curiosity about Jordan Peterson comes at an interesting time, uh, especially when it relates to the current state of Christianity and the church. Now, if you clicked on this video, and thanks for doing so, uh, you probably already know who Jordan Peterson is. But if you don't, just to give a little backstory, he's a clinical psychologist, a professor of psychology that taught at the University of Toronto and for a little time at Harvard, and has amassed nearly 4 million subscribers on YouTube, which is absolutely insane. And part of that is he's had a few interviews that went viral, but also the way that he talks to young men and young women in his lectures. He's able to take both sides of what well, seems to be a, a big conflict where he's, he's, he's able to take things from psychology, he's able to take things from science and evolution, but he also has a great mind when it comes to the Old Testament and the Bible. Sprinkle in a little bit of Disney movies and he's able to relate and connect to a, a huge amount of young adults as they try and figure out what they're doing with life. And uh, with 2020, he had to uh, basically disappear for a little while to cure himself from an opioid addiction and also deal with uh, some life-threatening illnesses to his wife. Uh, they've recovered and they've hit the YouTube scene stronger than ever uh, with various interviews from one interview talking with a Catholic bishop to the next week talking to an atheist, to the next week talking to a North Korean refugee. All these interviews that he does and what he says is um, intellectually stimulating. And what's been interesting is, especially with what he's gone through, he's giving off some C.S. Lewis vibes uh, before C.S. Lewis converted to Christianity. So anyway, my name is David Boyce. Uh, I'm the author of 52 Churches in 52 Weeks, uh, where I spent one year of my life uh, going on an adventure and trying to figure out what was happening to my own faith and um, what also was going on with millennials in the church and with what Jordan Peterson has done in the last few years in terms of attracting such a young demographic. It's it's raised a lot of eyebrows uh, from a lot of people, and myself included, in terms of what he's been able to communicate. So um, uh, before I go more into Jordan Peterson, I just want to, reason I'm doing this video is you may have heard in the news a few weeks ago about this poll. Uh, Gallup reported for the first time in eight decades, church membership had gone below 50% for Americans uh, for the first time ever since they've been doing this poll. And um, usually for the first six decades, it was always around 70%. And at the turn of the century, that started to decline. And with the advances of social media and the internet, uh, 2021, especially speeded up by the pandemic, church membership among Americans is down to 47%. And a big reason for that is the generations. Uh, millennials account for just 36% who identify as a member of a church. And, um, you know, when I started the 52 Churches in 52 Weeks project, um, I myself was becoming one of those statistics. And I had seen, I hadn't been to church, you know, maybe once or twice a year. Um, the only reason I, would, I went um, was just to be on the softball team, of all things. And I had seen a lot of my friends, family members, co-workers, all millennial young men who had grown up in a traditional church and found themselves on the outs and becoming full-blown atheists or that fun term, uh, spiritual but not religious. And I was trying to figure out why I was going down that same path. And uh, I think there's a few reasons why. 
Uh, I think the top three contributors are this. Uh, number one, social media and the internet. Um, there is so much at our fingertips right now. And I, I think back in the day, uh, people were looking for community and church provided that. And you look at with the advance in technology, with Facebook and Twitter and everything else, you can find you can find your tribe online with who you identify with to help uh, strengthen and enhance uh, your own beliefs. Um, I think second is just that perceived conflict between faith and science. Uh, it shouldn't be that way, but I think a lot of people see things where um, science is disproving uh, Christianity and faith and what have you, and that shouldn't be. I, I think they work uh, hand in hand, but there's been a lot of things in the past that the church has done to discredit science that it's caused more issue there. Um, I think the third reason, and I think the biggest thing, is this lack of identity within church as a whole. Um, like I remember, uh, I vaguely remember growing up, like Billy Graham uh, would speak in front of these stadiums and he would get on national television preaching. And when he retired, there wasn't really anything in his place as a strong Christian role model. Instead, what you saw uh, was a bunch of church scandals. Um, so you had the, the Baker family in the late 80s. You had uh, the Catholic sex scandals in the 90s and 2000s. That's When I grew up, that's all I saw in the news about church. All I knew about the Catholic faith is you had a pope and you had a bunch of priests that were um, physically abusing altar boys. That's all I knew about the Catholic Church. So that's what my little eyes would see. And as the years progressed and I got older, um, my knowledge base for the Catholic faith was that. It was it. Um, I think other things that you've seen is the number of church scandals uh, as of most recent, too. Um, almost every year, there is some megachurch pastor um, who is very well known, who gets himself in trouble. And last year it was Carl Lentz uh, of Hillsong Church in New York City, Justin Bieber's pastor, and he got outed by his affair partner once she learned that, oh, he's a world-famous pastor. Um, same thing uh, with Ravi Zacharias. Ravi Zacharias, for a time, was the guy to go to uh, from a Christian apologetic standpoint. If you wanted someone to defend the faith, you listen to Ravi Zacharias. And after he died last year, allegations began to surface about what he actually was doing um, with some of his side businesses and how he was corrupting uh, not just... Um, physically abusing young women, but also spiritually abusing them and gaslighting them to believe that they had to obey his will to please God. It was sickening for how he could get up on stage, just a complete narcissist, a complete snake, uh, as we all found out. So um, I, I think with a lot of the other churches that exist nowadays, especially with the mega churches, um, there's this, there's this lack of authenticity, I think, uh, for a lot of young people. Um, you, you hear from the Joel Osteens. You hear from um, Stephen Furtick to a certain extent, where Christianity doesn't cost anything. And that by accepting... Christ into your heart, everything in your life is going to get better. Uh, that's the whole prosperity gospel theme. And in addition to that, and one of the things I had seen 
was pastors, they're not vulnerable. And as a pastor, you are in charge of this congregation. You're in charge of all these people. And you don't want the gossip and the drama getting out if that pastor is vulnerable because what may the congregation think? And as a result, there is very little connection in the sermons. Um, if anyone has been to, and I like to call them cupcake churches, um, you go in, they, they give you some, some roo roo rah rah worship music, and you're singing, you're dancing, you're, you know, when it comes to these more contemporary modern mega churches, and you listen to the sermon, and they sprinkle in all these different type of Bible passages. They may add in a personal story that may be a little funny and they make their points. And then you leave service on this spiritual sugar rush. And eventually that comes down, but there's no real meat to it. You're just leaving, feeling good about yourself. And what Jordan Peterson has been able to, able to tap into is no, it's not like that. Life is suffering. And he goes into examples from the Bible where Christ suffered. And with Jordan Peterson, like he lives, he lives his truth. And, you know, if he's a little bit of a stark contrast to the different type of pastors that you see, um, on a national stage, but also from a small hometown stage. And that's what has brought in a lot of curiosity, um, not just from skeptics, but also with believers. Like, he, you can't fit him in a box. And it's, it's funny, the other day I was uh, watching, uh, I think it's uh, Alan Parr of The Beat, and he did a, a video on all these very famous preachers where he goes into is this preacher a false preacher? And some of the names on there just shocked me. Um, Francis Chan was on there. And the only reason that some people had stamped false teacher on Francis Chan was because he was at a conference. And at the conference, he shared the platform with another pastor that was a very prosperity gospel type of preacher. Um, he also had John Piper on the list where false teacher, like he said this thing a few years ago, um, not only that, but then his son has gotten quite a following on TikTok, um, trying to disprove religion. And it, it's interesting from a church standpoint, because there's just seems to be so much fighting inside the church. And a lot of people have left the church because there is a lack of inclusion. There's so much legality to different things. There's no adventure. You go to church and you stand and you sit. You stand and you sit. You stand and you sit. And you listen to the preacher preach and then you leave. Um, for a little while, um, of five years ago, um, the one pastor that had gotten quite a bit of a following among millennials was Tim Keller. Uh, he was a lead pastor at Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. I, I even went to go visit to see if I could see him preach. And I had one of three choices. I picked the wrong one, but um, that's another story. But with Tim Keller... I think one thing that really drew a lot of people into him was he would bring in these outside type of um, postmodern, secular type of worldviews and bring that into his sermon, but then also bring in the Bible to basically show, okay, here's what the Bible says versus the secular view, and here's why the Bible is much more concrete, and this is where the wisdom of the Bible comes in. And after service, he would also do Q and A's. And that got a lot of people interested because he wasn't just a preacher that preached at you. He was a Bible that wanted to bring in uh, believers, but also skeptics, bring them in the same house so there could be conversation, 
so that there could be dialogue. And um, th they eventually had to end that just because of uh, the large number of people that kept coming in for that. So with Jordan Peterson, now granted, Tim Keller retired um, not too long ago and uh, also had to deal with some medical issues. And that's where Jordan Peterson came in to kind of fill a little bit of a void because there really wasn't any type of Christian role model you could look up to um, from a millennial standpoint, from a young adult standpoint. And when you listen to Jordan Peterson, um, if you ever listen to one of his lectures, he's an interesting cat. He is all over the place. He takes the long way to grandmother's house to get to his point. Um, I, I've listened to some of his lectures where it takes five, 10, 15 minutes for him to build up this argument, build up what he's trying to get to. And you're just wondering when, when is this going to get, where's he going with this? And then all of a minute, then all of a sudden he's taking these stories and like he can intertwine and talk about old Testament stories from Adam to Eve to Noah to Moses. And I mean, I've been to some churches where like they in during the sermon, they'll talk about if the Old Testament should even be relevant within that church. And he's able to just bring forth these, these intellectual, educational type of angles to it that you would never see. It has to be fresh eyes to see this. And he's able to then relate that to Nietzsche and Carl Jung and Freud and Piaget and all these other great thinkers uh, within the last few hundreds of years. Uh, but then he's able to make sense of the Bible so that it's like the Bible isn't just some fairy tale myth from 2000 years ago. There's still validity into this. And he warns about the dangers of with the way that society has been going the last few years, what happens if you discard this? And it's, it's not a good, a good story. So when you're listening to him and he, you're, you know, you're listening for 10, 15 minutes, all of a sudden he just stops dropping these verbal hidden treasures. And anytime he's, he gets into that, it just wallops you. And it's so interesting to hear what he says about the church, what he says about Christ, what he says about some of these Old Testament stories uh, that even as a Christian, um, I've had a lot of trouble wrestling with if those are true compared to believing that Christ is true. Like, do I need to believe Adam and Eve talked to a talking snake and there was some talking donkey in the Bible? Um, I don't, I never necessarily believe that, but I believe Christ died for my sins. But because I don't believe in Adam and Eve and talking to these snakes and all these other things, does that make the rest of the Bible invalid? And if you, if you say that as a Christian, well, then you're stamped and you can't really have any kind of open conversation and you can't have any kind of dialogue. Um, I think with Jordan Peterson, he's been a glimmer of hope who knows science. He knows psychology. He knows the Bible and he's not even necessarily Christian. So you can't fit him in a box. He's not like all the other type of preachers. Even with Tim Keller for a while, uh, millennials would listen to him, but he would still get that false teacher stamp because, oh, he's a Calvinist. Well, Calvinists can't be right, so everything else he says has to be false. And that's where I think from a Christian perspective right now, it's so sickening where you don't know who to believe anymore, like who's telling the truth. And as a result, it seems like a lot of the young people out there are more going towards not just, you know, the, the secular worldview, but Jordan Peterson, who 
who don't necessarily identify as a member of a church, but they still have that spiritual but not religious type of moniker to their to their faith, I guess. So, but um, yeah, so. I'm still kind of trying to figure out Jordan Peterson. What's been interesting is because of what he's been through within the last year in a number of his podcasts, he's, he's broken down crying, trying to wrestle with if, if Jesus is real, like what does that mean for his life? What does that mean for everyone's life? Because it's that ultimate role model for humanity. And uh, I think there's a lot of Christians that are rooting for him to kind of see that, that, that light, so to speak. And uh, I, I saw, I've seen a number of uh, videos and, and blog posts, you know, at, telling people to pray for him. And um, I think part of that is, again, he's given off C.S. Lewis vibes. Whereas C.S. Lewis was an atheist, when he converted to Christianity, he became a very strong voice um, at a very uh, difficult time with World War II. And as we, um, you know, kind of towards the end of the pandemic here, um, we're entering the society where the world is, is changing pretty rapidly. So, but anyway, that's, that's all I got for this video. Uh, my name is David from 52 Churches in 52 Weeks. Um, hit the like and subscribe button to stay up to date for future videos. And until next time, we'll see you later.